Welcome to Align Spotlight, where you meet your manager. Hey Baird family, this is Jason Cooper from Asset Manager Research, and welcome to Align Spotlight, where you meet your manager. The financial market environment of 2022 has been unusual on several fronts. Stocks and bonds, which often move counter to each other, are selling off simultaneously. Inflation has proven to be much stickier than previously expected, and the war in Ukraine is causing shocks to a supply chain already weakened by COVID-19. Given the slate of factors, it's no surprise that we've been hearing a lot from advisors that are interested in real assets. So that's what we'll be talking about today. In episode nine of Align Spotlight, I have the pleasure of sitting down with DWS Real Assets PM, Evan Rudy, and product specialist, Andy Wilson. We'll discuss different types of real assets across sectors and industries, and we'll look at how they perform in varied macro environments. Evan and Andy will shed light on how their team uses this information to construct a portfolio of real asset securities. And finally, they share some insights into what important market trends they're keeping an eye on. Hi, Evan and Andy. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Jason. Hi, Jason. Thanks how are you? Doing well, thanks. And I've been fielding a ton of requests from advisors on real assets. Maybe the best place to start would be to answer what are real assets and a review of the four type of asset classes that your fund can hold. Absolutely, Jason. And uh, I'll start out the conversation again. Thanks for having us on the uh, webcast today. Uh, you know, if you look at the definition of real assets, uh, it's a broad definition and everybody has a different way of defining that space. Uh, if you look at how we at DWS define real assets, uh, and what we consider to be in the realm of real assets, we consider to be those physical or tangible assets that have an intrinsic value. So we consider the infrastructure, global infrastructure, global real estate, uh, commodities, and that's both the direct commodities as well as the commodity equities, or they call natural resource equities. We also include tips in there as well. Uh, what these have in common is the scarcity value. Again, these are, these are physical assets with uh, you know, upfront costs associated with bringing these to the market. So they're not easily replicated. There is a time between committing capital and having them uh, become available. So there is a bit of that mismatch between where demand for these assets are, and where supply is that can really lift asset prices. The other being the demand for these assets. You know, these, are, these are assets we use on a daily basis. A toll road you take to work, an office building that you work in, or those raw commodities that end up in the things we use every day like gasoline, or, um, or wheat that ends up in the bread that we eat every morning. Um, so again, that demand profile is steady um, and provides the ability for you know, these asset classes to pass on some of those higher input costs. So they provide that ability to hedge inflation uh, over the long term. The question we get a lot is how does real assets help my broader allocation in my portfolio? What are the, some of those complementary benefits of owning real assets? Uh, if, I so, if I look on the screen and I start kind of that right to left, you talk about attractive income, you know, things like real estate and infrastructure have long duration cash flows, very stable and predictable cash flows. So they help return some of that cash to shareholders in the form of an attractive yield. You know, these companies yield about three to 4% on average. So it provides the ability to find income in other areas other than traditional fixed income. When you look at inflation, we talk about, again, those assets with inelastic demand, uh, the ability to pass on higher input costs to the end users, and we're willing to pay those because, again, these are essential assets that help any functioning economy. That ability to uh, pass on those higher input costs allows them to pass you know, through the inflation on a quicker term, maybe the short to medium term, than equities do over the long term. So they can provide that ballast uh, to purchasing power in a higher inflationary environment. Uh, diversification is the, the third leg there. I think that's a really important one. When you look at asset classes and you look at the correlation of returns across asset classes over time, a lot of these asset classes have become more correlated. You think of small caps to large caps, international developed to domestic. Uh, you look at things like infrastructure and real estate, um, you know, since the early 2000s for infrastructure and since, you know, the 90s for real estate, but they still carry about a 0.6 to 0.7 correlation two-year broad equities defined by the MSCI World Index. Commodities are really that uncorrelated asset class, and TIPS have zero correlation to both uh, equities and kind of broad fixed income. So they provide that further ability to diversify your, your return stream within a well-diversified portfolio. Again, commodities 
since the early 90s about about a 0.35 correlation uh, to broad equities. I saved the left one for last because I think this is the most important one and probably the one that clients focus on the most, the return potential. Uh, if you look at you know, asset class returns over time, real estate and infrastructure have had very solid risk-adjusted long-term returns. What I mean by that is when you look at infrastructure, on average, since early 2000s, uh, it's done about a 12.5% annualized return. That's actually outpaced the MSCI world by over 2% on an annualized basis. For real estate, going back to the early 90s, and again, this is since the inception of these indices, it's done a little over 10% annualized return. And again, during more volatile times, they tend to hold up a bit better because of those predictable cash flows, because that inherent use case in these assets. So it provides an ability to give some of these additional benefits of diversification and inflation, the purchasing power, the income, but you're not sacrificing the returns. Commodities are ones that have had a little bit of tougher long-term returns, but there have been certain periods, and we'll, we'll walk through it in a little bit, when commodities have really shined as an asset class, and I think we're seeing that today in the current environment. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of wrap up with, if you look at the broad investment universe, we define it as infrastructure, real estate, natural resource equities, commodities, and tips. Uh, some examples underneath that, again, if you look at infrastructure, the transports, the toll roads, the airport operators, the seaport operators, you have things like utilities, the gas, electric, uh, water utilities. You look at communications, the cell phone towers that we see out our door every day. When you think about REITs, you know, again, things we use all the time, like industrial buildings, office, the malls we shop in, the apartments we live in. Um, for commodities, again, the things that end up in the things we use every day. So energy ends up in the gasoline that we put in our cars. Industrial metals, like aluminum, end up in the buildings that we use. Uh, and you look at precious metals, gold is one that everybody's familiar with. Silver, palladium uh, have industrial use uh, with them. And then agriculture, you think about things like corn and wheat end up in the food that we consume on a daily basis. Go back to kind of, again, how we define this space as those tangible assets that provide an intrinsic value for investors, but again, provide that, uh, that inherent use case on an everyday basis for us as consumers in a global economy. Thanks, Andy. I, I really appreciated how you highlighted you know, how diversified real assets are, because I think there's almost this assumption that they only generate strong returns during periods of high inflation. So, so maybe you could speak to your, your dual variable inv investment framework and why real assets should be strategically held as a portfolio allocation. That's a great point. And I'll, I think, you know, there's a couple ways of looking at that, you know, uh, inflation story. When we talked about these asset classes, having that inflation pass through, through REITs and infrastructure, through their cash flows, Either they can charge higher rents and a higher growth, because again, inflation doesn't happen in a vacuum, typically happens when you have stronger growth. Um, so they can charge higher rents for the assets that they're that people are using. Uh, or you think about commodities, again, if we're in a stronger environment, both inflation and growth, typically we're consuming a lot more of those types of commodities. There's a, there's a great chart that shows higher beta to inflation. This just shows that, you know, any time any times you see change in CPI, what has been the multiple response from a performance standpoint of different asset classes? I think what this really highlights is that commodities and natural resource equities have been a great place, more efficient areas of the market to capture returns when inflation is picking up. However, again, infrastructure and real estate have the ability either through uh, CPI bumps in their, res in their contracts uh, or the ability to charge higher rents or higher usage fees in environments where the economic environment is stronger, allows them to protect that purchasing power risk. But again, if we're not in a higher inflationary environment, you know, they can still produce good returns because there is that still inherent use case for these assets. Again, it's hard to live somewhere or work somewhere or put things in, you know, that you can't fit in your house somewhere without these assets or getting around the world, moving people and products globally would be very difficult if we didn't have the infrastructure necessary to do that. Maybe this is where I'll bring my, my colleague, Evan Rudy, and Evan is the lead portfolio manager of our diversified real asset strategy, to come into the mix and talking about how we look at it from the sector level, um, because I think that's really where, when you look at it from that inflation standpoint, you can really start to see the differences underneath each asset class, looking at the specific sectors, you can be a bit more efficient in capturing returns in certain environments. So maybe Evan, I'll turn it over to you to talk about how we think about it from the sector level. 
Thanks, Andy. That was a great introduction uh, to the entire real asset space. Like you said, each of the kind of top level asset classes has some unique attributes. But I think what makes real assets very interesting is how differentiated and granular you can get in terms of targeting um, allocations to different subsectors throughout the real assets universe. And kind of sticking on that same topic of inflation beta, commodities and natural resource equities tend to be kind of at the high level where you do tilt to get that kind of real, that real return, that inflation beta when inflation is higher, when inflation is accelerating. But if you look at kind of long-term risk-adjusted returns, you know, a lot of these asset classes, a lot of these buckets within real assets, these subsectors, perform better actually when inflation is decelerating. And that's, that's pretty consistent with overall equities as, uh, as well, too. But I think, you know, we're talking about liquid real assets here, so they do have those kind of equity characteristics over the long term. So, you know, real assets can work, and they usually do work fairly well when inflation is accelerating, inflation is a little higher. But it doesn't mean you have to have that to – uh, be a strong environment for real assets to work. So, you know, when you look at kind of, you know, the trade-off between risk-adjusted return and inflation beta, there can be that trade-off. There are a few kind of sweet spots where subsectors have performed very well kind of on a risk-adjusted basis as well as having that inflation beta. But you don't necessarily have to have that inflation beta within each one of those subsectors to provide that long-term return. This is the reason why we think being very tactical within real assets is key to that kind of long-term, strong risk-adjusted returns across multiple different environments, whether it be strong growth, you know, weak growth, high inflation, low inflation, whether acceleration and or deceleration. There's some pretty unique performance characteristics uh, depending on those different environments. You know, the way we like to look at it uh, really is that acceleration and deceleration in growth and inflation. Uh, and we've had some really kind of unique uh, movements in those variables over the last couple of years with what's taken place in shutting the world down for, for COVID and, you know, now then reopening and what's taking place currently, you know, with more, you know, Asia back in China being uh, a bit more locked down right now. So uh, the way we like to look at that is once again, if inflation accelerating, decelerating, growth accelerating, decelerating in, in four different kind of quadrant environments. And if you can picture kind of a quadrant model in front of you, growth accelerating would be on the top half of that and growth decelerating would be on, on the bottom half. Uh, where inflation accelerating on the right-hand side and inflation decelerating on the left-hand side. And if you look over time empirically, whether it's by asset class, but more particularly by subsector, you get, once I said, those unique performance characteristics in those different environments over time. And just to create a pretty big dichotomy, we'll talk about maybe two unique environments, something like a quadrant two environment. Quadrant two is where growth and inflation are accelerating. What does well in quadrant two? Well, it's more cyclical assets. So within the real asset space, it's natural resource equities. Within infrastructure, it's the rails, it's the energy infrastructure. Within real estate, it's more cyclical buckets, uh, you know, shorter duration buckets as well too, something like storage or hotels who have sh you know, shorter duration leases, or leases. Those tend to perform very well, have high call it hit rates. You know, uh, on average, they have strong returns. Uh, lower volatility, and their hit rate is very high in that quadrant two environment. So if we were looking at a kind of a quadrant two environment across real assets, we tilt towards those more cyclical buckets. And if you kind of flip the script and say, uh, you know, the opposite of a quadrant two is a quadrant four. Quadrant four, if you're looking at that, is that bottom left-hand quadrant uh, where both growth and inflation are decelerating. This tends to be where we end up in most recessionary periods. Just because you're in a quadrant four doesn't mean you're, you're in a recession, but if you're in a recession, you're most likely in a quadrant four. In a quadrant four, you're not necessarily looking for strong returns. You're really looking to protect capital. You know, you have both growth and inflation decelerating. Uh, so in quadrant four, something like tower companies and then infrastructure, you know, more REIT-like sectors with those, you know, pretty strong tailwinds in growth and less, you know, less elastic demand. Utilities do pretty well. Longer duration real estate does well, something like net lease companies. These companies can benefit from interest rates that are no longer rising, whereas in quadrant two, interest rates do tend to rise. And then those, those companies and those, those subsectors that can benefit from higher interest rates uh, tend to do better. So it really is, there are, you know, talked about the asset classes, four or five different kind of asset classes within real assets. But when you break it down to that subsector level, you know, you're talking 50 to 60 different kind of unique uh, return drivers within the real assets universe.
and, and then you have a unique portfolio construction process that takes advantage of those 50 to 60 unique subsectors. So maybe you could speak about how you diminish the risk that you incorrectly incor forecast emerging economic trends from a portfolio construction per perspective, you know, how your model works and influences how you're building out your portfolios. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that is absolutely vital to the way we think about allocating capital on an ongoing basis. You know, I talked about the two kind of two variables that drive a lot of our thought process when, when allocating capital. But if you think about, you know, trying to forecast growth and or forecast inflation, obviously nobody's very good at it. We're not very good at it. The Federal Reserve hasn't been too good at it as well either. A lot of economists haven't done, been great. So that can be pretty difficult to do. So the, the way we've approached it is to essentially take each of those four different quadrants and we create what we call our model portfolio for each of those four different kind of unique environments based on that rate of change in growth and inflation. So we actually have a quadrant one portfolio, a quadrant two portfolio, a quadrant three portfolio, and a quadrant four portfolio that all look fairly unique. But instead of saying, you know, inflation accelerated this past quarter and growth started to decelerate, therefore we're in a quadrant three, you know, we're forward looking. So what we've done is say, okay, based on you know, the consensus forecast for growth and or inflation, where are we most likely to be? But then also knowing that since nobody's been very good at predicting growth and inflation, we've built kind of a forecast error into that model. And so what that, that allows us to do is understand the probability of being in each one of those four unique quadrant environments. And so once again, instead of saying we were in a quadrant three and owning that quadrant three portfolio, we would say the probability of being in quadrant three is we have about 34 percent in, in the second quarter. You know, maybe it'll change as we uh, get through the quarter into the third quarter. But just for an example, you know, we have a slightly greater probability of inflation decelerating in the second quarter than accelerating and a higher probability of growth decelerating uh, it, uh, currently than growth accelerating. So what that, what that means is we probability weight each one of those four different quadrant models. And so once again, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket into a single quadrant portfolio. Essentially what you're doing is you're biasing or tilting towards those subsectors that have been more efficient at capturing returns, given what is the most probable economic environment. But a portfolio is also balanced enough and should be robust enough to survive a, a number of different uh, economic outcomes or market behaviors. And we think over time, by tilting towards those kind of subsectors uh, that have produced those kind of unique environment, unique return characteristics in those different environments, we can pair those off against one another, and over time, should be able to hit a, hit, hit enough of those that it provides value on a relative basis to a static real assets portfolio. So once again, four unique quadrant four, four unique quadrant environments, four unique model portfolios. And then probability weighting each of those four portfolios based on you know, the most recent economic data uh, to get us to that kind of overall portfolio that is, once again, tilted or biased towards that kind of quadrant portfolio that we think is, is most likely. Great. And your real asset fund has benefited tremendously from the fact that DWS already had dedicated strategies focusing on commodities, infrastructure, and REITs. Can you speak to the depth of the analyst teams and how you work with other PMs and analysts in generating the best ideas to, to gain those subsector exposures? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, long before we hey, launched our diversified real asset strategy in 2016, we had core strategies in each of our kind of three core pillars. So, you know, we started our global real estate strategy with a U.S. strategy back in the early 90s and have been running global real estate portfolios for over 15 years. Uh, in commodities, we've, we've been running commodity port and natural resource portfolios for over a decade and in infrastructure uh, as well, too, for over a decade. So three kind of core pillars with teams uh, on our liquid real assets group within each one of those. And then essentially what happens is I went through the kind of the allocation model but we really are relying on collaboration among the entire team. And if you look at the entire platform, including myself, we have 10 portfolio managers uh, focused on liquid real assets, as well as 22 different analysts. The depth of that team is very unique. When we are kind of making asset allocations to or from different subsectors to different asset classes, we have experts within each one of those unique subsectors and those asset classes that we can rely on. One thing that stood out for us is having kind of that whole team under one umbrella allows us to be fairly nimble within 
our strategy, but really have expertise within there. So if I need to know what's going on in, in a certain commodity or within a certain country's real estate market, or whether it's Chinese gas market, I can reach out to each one of those analysts, each one of those PMs that covers that and say, we hold this name in the real assets portfolio because it's one of your better ideas in your core portfolio, you know, what's happening and understand what's going on in those markets. So I think that is, a, that is key for us in running a diversified real assets portfolio. There are a wide array of different asset classes you're covering. You're covering everything from storage companies in the U.S. to palladium markets in South Africa and, and Russia and you know, soybean oil markets in Indonesia, gas pipelines in China and Japan. Great. And it just seems like an opportune time for a real asset allocation, given some of the statistics that you highlighted, especially from a portfolio diversification perspective. Um, what do you guys think will be some of the most important or interesting trends to monitor for, for real asset investors on a go, go forward basis? So I think it is a unique time for real assets. The last 10 years or so prior to 2020 was a bit of a challenging time for real assets. We'll look at a kind of a blend of real asset indices, uh, you know, going back from 2002. So call it, we have 20 years of data on this kind of this blend. You know, they did fairly well from 2002 to 2011 ish relative to global equities. Commodities were strong. Inflation during that, that previous cycle ran somewhere two and a half to three and a half percent on average from kind of 02 to 08. And then obviously we had the financial crisis, slow growth, and really no inflation for most of the last 10 years. So, you know, we saw significant underperformance relative to call it your 60-40 or your growth portfolios. And I think what we're seeing now is this inflationary environment that won't be so benign. I'm not calling for any type of runaway inflation or inflation sticking around 7-8% for multiple years. But I think there's a very good chance we could have inflation sticking above 2.5%, 35 you know, percent uh, for the next couple of years. And that's a pretty good environment for real assets. So I think looking at those long-term inflation expectations, whatever's priced in the market, uh, I think it'd be fairly unique. You've also seen a quick rise in, in real rates and that rise in nominal rates as well, too. And, you know, what that does is kind of it can close some valuation gaps. And at the end of the day right now, you know, a lot of real asset, uh, the uh, real asset universe is a little bit more value oriented, uh, a lot less growth oriented within there. So if you have rising interest rates, whether it be nominal and or real, those higher multiple companies tend to get hurt a little bit more as that discount rate really drives uh, a lot of that multiple compression. And so I think, I think that's something else within the real asset space that can be a bit of a tailwind on a relative basis over the next couple of years. If we are able to maybe normalize interest rates a bit without having too much of a, of a hard landing uh, on the growth side, you know, nominal growth is still over 10% with the latest print. So we have strong growth still. Uh, we'll see what the interest rate uh, market takes us, but I think value versus growth does favor uh, real assets as well as the inflationary environment currently. And maybe the last thing uh, on the commodities and natural resource side, obviously commodities have been uh, in the spotlight, especially with the war in Ukraine. I think that was really the trigger for a lot of focus on commodities, but the supply demand dynamics of commodities have been fairly tight for some time. And that the war seemed to be the catalyst for really that big move higher uh, in commodity prices. So I think we need to see a lot more investment in capital expenditures in the commodity and natural resource space over the next couple of years to alleviate some of the supply constraints uh, we see going forward. You know, not only on the energy side, but even though you know, if we want to you know, electrify the world over the next couple of decades, real assets are going to be a key component of that, whether it's metals or traditional fossil fuels used to produce new metals or you know, wind turbines, electrifying the grid through the utilities. So maybe kind of regime change now with higher interest rates that, that can favor real assets, as well as some longer term structural underinvestment that just provides a few more tailwinds over the coming years. Just to add to uh, to Evan's comments, we've seen a bit more of this shift from that, as Evan said, that traditional 60-40 model to maybe something that is looks more like a 50-30-20 model, where you still have equity fixed income, but maybe this other bucket that can help provide more efficient returns, more differentiated returns, uh, building portfolios that are more resilient to changes in the economic environment over the long term. And, you know, these asset classes maybe hadn't been available in previous decades, you know, now have the ability to be included as part of a broader asset allocation. 
So we're seeing more of that adoption, you know, for real assets to, again, provide some of that balance to expected return. Everything kind of goes in waves, but I, I don't think we can expect the same kind of, you know, easy monetary policy, uh, low interest rate environment, you know, high equity returns in the last decade in, in the decade we're going to go into. But again, you know, things always change. It's building the portfolios over the long term for resiliency. And again, looking at overlap, you know, these areas that we've been talking about in real assets, you know, real estate, the infrastructure, the commodities. If you look at traditional indices, they're really underrepresented. I mean, if you just look at it from a GIC sector format, you know, they tend to be the bottom five GIC sectors that's talking materials, industrials, energy, REITs, and utilities from a, from a GIC sector perspective. But even from a name overlap, you don't really get exposure to these types of businesses in your traditional indices. So it can provide, again, not only from the correlation standpoint, that diversification, but uh, from a name perspective, getting exposure to these uh, businesses, these differentiated businesses that have provided you know, very attractive uh, attributes and returns over time, there's kind of a mind shift, I think, overall globally from a client perspective um, that I need to think about portfolio construction a bit different. And this asset class of real assets can really be a nice ballast to what has traditionally been uh, an asset allocation amongst equities and fixed income. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I do want to thank you both for your partnership with Baird and also for taking the time to join me today. Uh, It's going to be a great opportunity for the advisors to hear directly from you guys what this real asset environment looks like and and how they can think about allocating their clients' capital to indemnify themselves against some of the risks that you guys highlighted. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate it. I, I only really have one question for you on today's after show, and it's, you know, we added DWS Real Assets to the satellite sleeve in the spring of 2021. I'm just curious, what did you see as a PM that necessitated the move into real assets? Well, the first step, even before adding DWS, was adding real assets to our strategic asset allocation for the portfolios, and that happened several years ago. Uh, a different fund, Principal Diversified Real Asset, was our first foray into real assets for a line. And, and that was, it, it's still a solid fund. And it, it was the first one that um, we found that we like really for that broad real asset exposure. And the fund is still on a recommended list as well. But one thing that became more concerning to us over time for its use in a line and how we're including it as a diversifier in the satellite sleeve was the fund has a, a large allocation to what they call a real return sleeve comprised of commercial mortgage-backed securities, tips, and floating rate notes. And the floating rate notes, to me, were the the most concerning part of that because while they're using it as a source of yield and return, those are low-quality issues with high credit risk, and that equates to higher correlations with stocks. And at that point, floating rates had come to represent almost 20% of the fund. And beyond that, the rest of the real return allocation was facing different challenges with the low interest rates at the time um, offering minimal return potential from that piece. So so there we had a, a pretty significant part of the portfolio that either wasn't doing as much work diversifying equity risk or didn't provide the return potential that we like to see from that part of the allocation. And none of that really gave us true real asset exposure. So now early last year with inflation simmering and the risks to equities and fixed income markets growing more pronounced, we wanted really true exposure to real assets and and DWS provides that. So we ran extensive analysis to make sure we fully understood how DWS would impact the portfolio's risk reward characteristics if we were to make that change. And we found that it was really an improvement on all counts. It it, it gave us better prospects for returns. It, it gave us lower risk and also stronger diversification. So ultimately, the decision to upgrade and replace principal with DWS was a a relatively easy one. So that was just over a year ago and now conviction remains high. And we also added the fund to our um, Baird 
uh, align you may select Baird research models in April. So uh, that was recognition that uh, the environment remains favorable for real assets as a, a diversifier. And it's obviously been a, a difficult start to the year with equities down and, and bonds just had their worst quarter in uh, more than 40 years. And with equities and fixed income down at the same time, that's really when satellite diversifiers like DWS can earn their place in the portfolio. So the fund's strong year-to-date performance relative to equity and fixed income markets, it has benefited portfolios. And that's just further confirmation that real assets can produce solid returns and act as a diversifier even when equities and fixed income are, are both struggling at the same time. And in an inflationary environment, it's one of the few places where you can really get solid diverse diversification. So, you know, Jason, I'd like to flip the tables and ask you a question as well, because you're our team's real asset expert. You identified DWS and we added the fund to our recommended mutual fund list even before it was in a line. So you know, I want to ask you, what attracted you to the strategy and what really made it stand out to you relative to peers? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there were two things that stood out. And the first was just the macro environment. I mean, we'd really undergone unprecedented fiscal and monetary easing. Um, and, and as a result, the team actually examined the prospect of a higher rate of inflation back in like the back half of 2020. Um, and when we looked at the recommended mutual fund list, there was this understanding that so much of our diversified real asset product had exposure to fixed and in particular tips, which are an inflation hedge. But at the same time, those were priced to generate, you know, real negative returns on a go forward basis. So when we looked at the prospect of rising inflation, it just made sense to us to have something that represented a pure play real asset vehicle on the rec, rec list. And the other thing that really stuck out to me was just the process. I mean, the team has a robust, repeatable and forward looking process, which is actually rare for uh, for diversified real asset managers. I mean, we just heard Evan and Andy, you know, speak about the strategy for about 30 minutes and the logic behind the fund is philosophically sound and just so differentiated. Um, after our research, it, to me, it was, a, it was a no brainer from an ad perspective. Great. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. And uh, I think this is just a great example of our process in action as well. And to me, DWS really does stand out as best in class. And uh, of course, you know, that's exactly what we want and in, in what clients should expect from the line portfolios. Yeah, I totally agree, Aaron. And, you know, quick, quick after show today, but thank you for your time. You bet. Have a good one. Well, what did you think? It was great having Evan and Andy on to cover DWS's macro-driven real asset investment process. I also hope you enjoyed the after show with Aaron Benson. We appreciate your feedback as we continue to create premium content. Are there any other Align managers you'd like to hear from? Reach out to AMR and we'll be sure to respond.